Hallelujah. First Thessalonians chapter number two, verse 18. First Thessalonians chapter two, verse 18. It sounds like music in my ear. The sweetest name I know. Oh, how I love Jesus. I'm trying to let this alone. But I feel like the enemy has tried to shut our worship up. But oh. How I, I love Jesus. I know we're in COVID times and, and we're worshiping differently, but oh, how, how I, I, I love Jesus. And not for any other reason other than the fact, because he firm love, love me. There is a name I, I love to hear. I love to sing his word. It sounds like music in, in my ear. The sweetest name on earth. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again. And, and here is something that every one of you can say. Paul says, I've, I'm coming to you again. I'm reaching out to you again. I'm giving you another chance again. But these three, these four words somehow always get in the way. I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Wherefore, we, we, we have come unto you, even I, Paul, once again. But Satan hindered us. Ugh. Here I am trying to do it again, but Satan hindered us. Here I am trying to get that business off the ground, but Satan has hindered me. Here I am trying to get my family back on track. Here I am trying to get my employment back on track. Here I am trying to work with my child. Here I am trying to work with my wife, my husband, my friends. Here I am trying to get back in good standings with my sister, my brother, my niece, my nephew, my cousin. But Satan has a way of hindering us. If Satan has been hindering you in any way, this message is for you. Over the next few moments, I want to talk on this subject. Dealing with distractions. Dealing with distractions. Let me start off by defining what I mean by distractions. A distraction, by definition, is a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to what's in front of them. God has set before you and your family an open door. But because the enemy knows that if you access that door, you will un unleash a power that will set your entire bloodline free, he always, always introduces a distraction. Don't miss what I just said. If you just say distraction, you will miss the feasibility of the terminology. Dis. Traction. You see, if I am walking on this floor, the only reason why I'm able to move is because the bottom of my shoe 
creates a bond with the top of the surface. And that kinetic energy is called traction. If this were ice, walking wouldn't be so easy because in the presence of ice, traction is little to absent. So what the devil does is he always finds a way to put a gap in between you and your foundation so that you have distraction. How many of you are in your life, you just cannot seem to find your footing? You can't find your footing in your money. You can't find your footing in your relationship. You can't find where you fit on your job because you are distracted. The word dis in the Latin means apart. And try here means to drag. It's the Latin uh, dis try here, dis drag. Listen, so a distraction, help me, Holy Ghost, to help your people. A distraction is when you're dragged away from what you're destined to do. Anytime you get close to your destiny, life, the enemy, and adversary will be used by the evil forces of the world to drag you away from the... That's why Paul said, no matter what, I pressed toward the mark for the prize, but, but understand that that the only reason why he had to press is because there was a distrag, a distraction, something that is pulling him away from what he was supposed to be doing. And just like life, the Bible is full of instances in which a distraction was implemented. David, even though he was a man after God's own heart, saw a woman taking a bath on the roof and used his power to get her to come to his bedchamber even so much where he sent her wife to be killed. See, he was distracted by lust because lust is a distraction. You remember Samson who had his head in the wrong lap. He was distracted by a relationship that he had no business being in. Eve was in the middle of the garden, in the cool of the day, had been given authority over the entire garden, but she was distracted by what was off limits. Everybody, I don't care how saved you are, you can be distracted. I, I, this message isn't for the overzealous, for those of y'all who are holier than the rest of us, for those of y'all who pray three times a day and fast twice a month, this is for those of us who set a New Year's resolution on the first and by the third you're already struggling to keep it. This is for people who are saying to themselves, I cannot believe. That after 2020, I am already in the middle of the first month of the year, and I'm already tired. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. To those of you who were celebrating in December and just were excited about the fact that 2020 was coming to an end and you had this burst of energy coming into 2021, nobody told you that by this time of the month, you'd already be ready to throw in the towel. Something has distracted you. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how big your house is. I don't care if you have a walk-in closet. I don't care if you have a three-car garage. I don't care if you have two dogs. I don't care what purse you carry. I don't care what kind of watch you have on. I don't care if it's an Audemars or a paddock. I don't care if you carry a Michael Kors or a Hermes bag. Everybody can be got by some sort of distraction. I don't care if the album went platinum or if it went wood. You can get distracted. <laughs> I don't care if you're the top of the class or the bottom of the class. Everybody 
has to deal with some sort of distraction. And I know you tell yourself, self, this is the year. I'm going I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to reclaim my time, and I'm going to do the best I can. But the moment you make up your mind to do better, distraction. The moment you make up your mind that you're going to be in charge of the garden, here comes the snake. The moment you decide that you're going to preach the gospel, here comes the stones. The moment you decide that you're going to play the harp for your king, here comes the spears. The moment you decide that you're going to serve your son, here comes the assassination plot. The moment you decide not to bow, here comes the fiery furnace. The moment you decide to give your dream, here comes the pit. There's always a distraction. You know, I've learned, write this down, that distractions come in three basic forms. I'm about to put you on game. The devil about to be mad at me, but I'm here for you today. I let the Lord handle him. I'm about to give you the keys to the game. There are three basic ways that the enemy distracts. Number one, you writing? The first thing that the devil tries to distract you from is your identity. The first thing the enemy wants to distract you from knowing is who you are. And sometimes he will allow the failures of people around you to stick out like sore thumbs because your life will not get better because you found out what was wrong with them. Your life will only get better when you find out what's wrong with you. So he distracts you with trying to fix everybody around you. When deliverance only comes when you work on what's inside of you. He distracts you with your identity and your identity will constantly be challenged. Hear me, Holy Ghost. Hear me. This ain't a sermon. This is a message. Because the enemy knows is he, if he can convince you of something other than what you are in Christ, he can throw you off track. So if you identify yourself with what you do for a living, but you don't identify yourself by who you are in Christ, you will work so hard at the job, you'll spend no time on the destiny. If he can throw you off track, if he can make you think, that you're less than, if he can make you think that you are rejected, if he can make you think that you are insecure, if he can make you think that nobody loves you, if he can, if he can continue to, to peddle and propagate the fact that your heart is broken and you'll never recover and you'll never trust again, see, he'll mess up your identity and you will identify yourself with a crisis instead of identifying yourself with a Christ. So he will distract you in your identity. If you want me to go deeper, type deeper. If you want help, if you want me to go help, I will help you, but I need to see it in the comments. If you want me to go deeper, say deeper. If you want more help, say help. All right, here's number two. The second form that the enemy distracts you, that he distracts you in, listen, listen. When the enemy is trying to distract you, first of all, he works on your identity. If identity doesn't work, Then the second thing he does is he works on your rhythm. What do I mean? He will either try to speed you up or slow you down. And both of them are dangerous. Both of them are dangerous. The enemy will either try to get you to act too soon or he will put you in a position where you will not act soon enough. And he uses fear and insecurity to keep you from acting. So he will either freeze you or fry you. How many of you right now watching me? Understand that he didn't get the identity, but he did get the rhythm because there are some things that you should have done by now that you have not done. And there are some things that you should not have done. And you have done them a multiplicity of times. When the enemy is after you, he messes with your rhythm. Help me, Holy Ghost. He will have you doing things too soon and, and he'll have you places you shouldn't be too soon and, and, and he'll make you get married too soon or, or he'll make you separate too soon. When he's after your life, he messes with your rhythm. He'll make you quit too fast or he'll make you start too fast. When the enemy is after you, he either speeds you up or he slows you down. 
Look at, look at the enemy trying to get Jesus to come off of his destiny. Remember, Jesus walks up to the mountain and the devil shows him everything and, and God has a plan. But Satan says, all right, jump off the cliff lest you dash your foot against a stone. See if your daddy has sent angels. Look at him trying to get God to do something it wasn't time for him to do. When the enemy wants you to fall victim to the distraction. He tries to get you to do things out of sequence. There's double on the other side. He will give you twice what you lost. I don't know who that is for today, but somebody just type double. Get ready for everything that you lost. God says, I'm about to reclaim your time. I'm about to redistribute wealth. I'm about to give you everything you lost. And when I give it back, it'll be bigger than what you lost. Somebody shout double. You know, I hate to pause, but let me tell you something. There is one thing to receive the word. It's another thing to administer and follow the word. And there are so many parts of the scripture that talk about health and happiness and healing. But there's also many scriptures on giving. It is said that the scriptures talk more about giving than heaven and hell combined. Let me tell you something. The Bible says money answereth all things. And you want to make sure in 2021 that your money is in the right place so you can reap the right thing. I believe this is harvest season. For all of the hell and high water that we've gone through over the past 12 months, I believe God has the ability, capability, and desire to give us a blessing that is big enough that we don't have room enough to receive. I want you to get your gift ready right now. That's it. Right now, I want you to get it. And I want you to give as you've been prospered. Not to keep up with anybody not begrudgingly, not to feel bad, but give as God has prospered you. That God really wants us to have a spirit of generosity that when we give, we give freely. And when we give freely, we can receive freely. To all of my Lighthouse 2.0, my online church, I thank you. You are a campus. I look at you like that and thank you for allowing me to be your pastor. I want you to use Givelify. And I want you to give your gift there. For those of y'all who watch us online, whether it's YouTube or Facebook or through our app, you can give by text to give or at our website, lhhouston.church. Those are the only secure ways that you can give other than sending it in and bringing it in. All other forms of requests are illegitimate. And please don't subscribe to any of them. We're not on Cash App. We're not uh, in any of those places as it relates to being a church. So I want you to give right now. And I want you to give. And I pray, God, that you would bless each gift and each giver 100-fold. Blow their mind with the increase that's about to come. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Check out the second part of this word. I know I'm preaching. You ain't got to say nothing. He'll, he'll speed you up or slow you down. And, and because you're... you're you're so aggressive and, and, and you want to be the first to do it and you want to be the youngest to do it and, and you want to be the first in your family and, and you want to do it by the time you're 30 and you want to do it by the time you're 35. You want to, you want to be married by 25 and a baby at 28, but, but maybe you're still a baby at 28. He'll get you. He'll get you out of sequence. The best thing you could ever do for yourself is be like the sons of Issachar and understand the times. When he distracts you, he'll distract you in identity. He'll distract you in rhythm. He'll either speed you up or slow you down. Number three, this is the way I'm telling you, I'm putting you on game. I'm giving you a million dollars worth of game for free 99. You listening? Number three, he'll present you with a counterfeit version of what you actually desire. Right at the point of breakthrough, the enemy will distract you with a counterfeit bill that looks like the authentic thing. It will look like the perfect person. It will look like the perfect job. It will look like the perfect set of circumstances. It will look like the perfect business partner. It'll look like it. And you won't be able to separate the wheat from the tear. It will look like the outcome to the answer you have been asking. But all of these things will also involve a compromise. This is how you know the enemy 
is distracting you is he'll send you a counterfeit and you will compromise your destiny because it scratches an itch but doesn't provide destiny. So you won't know who you are. You won't know when you should do it and you won't even know if it's real. And here you are doing something that's not real at a time that's not right, not even knowing who you are, a recipe for distraction. How many of you all can raise your virtual hand right now and say, Reverend, I didn't know it before you got in my face today, but I must admit I'm distracted. I'm distracted. I'm distracted. I'm holy, but I'm distracted. I go to church online every Sunday, but I'm distracted. I got a Bible on my nightstand, but I'm distracted. I, I pray. And let me tell you something. I'm so good at being distracted. I know how to ask forgiveness for my distraction. Oh, don't you better holler at your boy. Don't you sit up there and look at me like I'm just talking to myself. Some of you are distracted, but you know how to pray. You're distracted, but you know how to repent. So you allow the distractions because you know that you got grace. But to every man is given a measure. A measure of grace. How many of y'all say I'm distracted? I, I, I sometimes let the haters get on my nerve. I sometimes bow down and, and fall victim to a response that beneath me. Come on and raise your hand. I just, and I'm talking about us. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about us. So I figure if I put us in this thing, we can get delivered together. Is there anybody who will admit I get distracted? My temper will get a hold of me and I will blow a top. I will get you together. I know how to put enough words together that will make you apologize for something you didn't do wrong. Anybody ever been distracted? Because the devil will mess with your identity. After he messes with your identity, he messes with your rhythm. After he messes with your rhythm, he, he sends you something that's counterfeit. And now you're compromising because you're distracted by being lonely, so you date a non-Christian. <laughs> you, you get distracted by being lonely, so you, you'll settle for unequally yoked so that you can have quality time. You're going to get mad at me today. You probably ain't going to watch me no more, but it's all right because the world might end. I can't wait on you to get happy whether waiting on me to give the word that the Lord want me to give. I'm talking to somebody right now. I am like your surrogate father on duty, letting you know that even in the spirit, I can hear you. Even through the Internet, I can feel you that you will compromise for something you know isn't correct. All because... It's a carefully plotted distraction by the enemy. And, and can I be honest? It ain't always easy to walk away from your distractions. Because sometimes the distractions seem to be a blessing. Sometimes <laughs> the distractions seem to be sent by God. All but one of Paul's letters begin with thanksgiving. All except one, let me say that for, for the critics, the book of Galatians doesn't, but all of the others start off with a congratulatory message. Paul begins this book similarly, but he begins this particular portion of our scripture differently than he does the rest. See, when Paul begins the book of Galatians, he begins that with a reprimand to Christians who sought to, prefer, uh, to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Acts tells us that Paul was driven out of Thessalonica by the men. I, I thought about that, that, that he was driven out of Thessalonica by people that he was trying to preach the gospel to. It, it ain't like he came there to rob them. It isn't like he came there to break their heart. It isn't like he came there to lie to them. He actually came with good tidings. He brought them the gospel, and they didn't want it. Then the Lord told me that just because you're good doesn't mean you'll always be accepted. Just because you had good intentions doesn't mean that the people you tried to be good to were expecting goodness. 
Some people wouldn't know what to do with goodness if it hit them in the head. Paul was driven out by people that he wanted to help. No matter how good the gospel is, it still had its opponents. And let me tell you, no matter how good you are, no matter how good your message is, listen, no matter how good your heart is, you will always have somebody who opposes it. So to all of you all who said, why did they treat me that way? I was just trying to be good. Even good has its enemies. Oh, Keon, you preaching. Preach, boy. I think I will. Because see, some of y'all are listening to me right now and, and you're in shock because you thought that if you were good, it would turn out good. You thought if you were honest, you would get honesty in return. You thought if you gave money, you would get appreciation. And some of you all, like me, have, have spilled everything you had into cups that couldn't contain it. Paul gave them everything he had, and they still ushered him out. Paul gave them the gospel, and they still ushered them out. Paul gave them an opportunity to go to heaven, and they still ushered him out because even good has its enemies. Let me tell you, I don't care how good you are. I don't care how much you tithe. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care if you don't lie on nobody. I don't care if you don't bother anybody. I don't care if you don't gossip. Good still has its enemies. People will hate you because you were good. Have you ever heard of people, uh, you know, and, 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 and we all have said it, I, I don't know, I don't like them, they just, they just too good. They just too nice, they just too nice. How are you too nice? See, what that actually means is, is that, that they are too opposite of what I can handle. How do you get too nice? I need somebody to be rough. Yeah, you, you want them rough until they rough you up. Paul, Paul says, I can't believe y'all putting me out. I'm a good man and you still putting me out. I wish I could have been there to say, Paul, in this world, you will have trouble. I wish I could have told him, Job 14 said, a man born of a woman is of a few days. I, I, wish I, I, I wish I could have been there to tell him, oh, Job, excuse me. I, I wish I was telling Paul, listen, uh, Job and John, they'll all tell you uh, this, this thing didn't go well for them either. I, they, they were trying to preach the gospel, and John, he ended up on an Isle of Patmos all by himself, and, and Job ended up losing his kids. Even though he was righteous, he lost his wife. She went crazy. He lost his friends. They turned their back on him, his cattle, his money, everything. But Job would also tell you that even when I got through the distraction, I got doubled. And I am coming to tell you today that if you find a way to handle your distraction, God told me to tell you there's double on the other side. He will give you twice what you lost. I don't know who that is for today, but somebody just type double. Get ready for everything that you lost. God says, I'm about to reclaim your time. I'm about to redistribute wealth. I'm about to give you everything you lost. And when I give it back, it'll be bigger than what you lost. Somebody shout double. God's going to give you double for your trouble. Have, have you, let me ask this question. Have you, ever, have you ever pursued something that you believe to be God's will for your life? only to be distracted by obstacles that made you wonder, is this where I'm supposed to be? Have you ever, I'm saying like God told you to do it, but by the time you put your hand to the plow and all of those obstacles start coming up, you start asking yourself, am I supposed to be here? Have you ever gotten into something that you said to yourself, Surely this can't be the will of God. Raise your hand if you're sure. I mean, you got in it. You started it. It got rough and you had to ask yourself, I know God wouldn't put me in this kind of mess, this foolishness. I, I, know, I know this ain't God because sometimes obstacles can make you obsessed with the other side of the opportunity. You'll be, you'll be distracted. And, and, and you'll be wondering if God told you to do this. And if you have ever felt like this, I come to relieve you of the duty of worrying. You are not alone. 
All your brothers and sisters online right now, they feel just like you. They are asking the questions and typing and saying, God, if you wanted me to do this, why isn't it easier? If you wanted me to do this, why didn't you send me help? If you wanted me to do this, why didn't you, get, why didn't you send me somebody who would understand how to carry the weight of my emotions? If you wanted me to be in this, why didn't you send me somebody who would understand me? If you wanted me to go to this church, why didn't you send me to a church that appreciated me? If you wanted me on this job, why didn't you send me to a job that would promote me? If you wanted me to help these children, why didn't you give me children that would understand that what I am doing is trying to to love them the best way I know how. Sometimes God will send you in a direction with no directions. He'll send you in a direction with no directions because he's trying to see if you need a shepherd or if you want to steer. This is Paul's position. This is Paul's position. And Paul uses this letter to speak against the opposition of the Jews to the gospel. And in this verse that we're looking at, this verse before us turns to his own relationship with the Thessalonians. Look at it. The Bible says that he had been asked by the people he had served to leave the city against his will. He wasn't even ready to go. And Ross, they put him out. He, he was willing to stay. They asked him to go. Have you ever been somewhere where you were unwanted? Isn't it amazing how people won't want you and they want you to stay in the situation of unwanted? Because as long as they don't want you, but they don't want anybody else to have you, so rather than give themselves to you, they will keep you, but they won't want you. Let me tell you, everybody that keeps you don't want you. <laughs> don't you think that just because it's still going that you're wanted, some of you are just tolerated. Or the benefit of having you is better than the benefit of losing you, but there is a difference between tolerating you and celebrating you. Paul brought them the gospel, and they asked him to leave. I gave you the gospel, and you don't want me? If it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be saved. This is what Paul is saying. And they escorted him out. And the Bible says they escorted him out. Listen, not at day, but at night. They, they didn't want him so bad that they put him out. And they didn't even want people to see them escorting him out. They didn't even want to be seen with them. They escorted him out of the city by night. And Paul could not find the words strong enough to describe his pain of this separation. I'm about to give you something. Oh, I feel like it. I don't know why I feel like this. I don't feel like this all the time, but I feel like a spirit of ministry on me. I feel like God is actually giving me a rhema word. I'm so far off my notes. I don't know what to do, but I hear the Lord talking to me right now. They are escorting Paul out by night, hiding him after he brought them the gospel, put him on game, and they want him gone. And then the Lord showed me. You ready? Sometimes God will use a person or a situation to escort you out of a thing when you don't know it's time to move on. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. You don't understand what God protected you from when he had somebody you wanted to escort you out. You don't know. You think you were in pain now. You don't understand how much pain you would have been in next year. Some of y'all need to start thanking God right now that they escorted you out by night. Hey, we're going to have to break it right there. This word is rich, but it also has a lot of depth. And I don't want to try to give it all to you at once. So listen, just join me next week for the second part of this message dealing with distractions because I believe it's worth two weeks of your life to set you free for the rest of your life. Join me next week. Man, what? 
yet another powerful word from our shepherd. I know I'm charged off of that word to live a better life and to be charged and go in the direction of my destiny. Listen, it was amazing having you all here today. If you didn't get a chance to give today, those instructions are at the bottom of the screen. So feel free to follow those instructions as you may give into the Lord as you've been given back to. Also, if you would like to be a part of our Lighthouse family, whether you live in Houston or you live abroad, there is a place in this family for you. Those instructions on how to be a part of this family are also listed at the bottom of the screen. Now, before we go, I just want to have a word of prayer with you all to, for the Lord to keep us until the next time we get together. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the word that has been given. We thank you for the songs that have been sung, all of it collectively.